This area is still off limits to Louvre security, Bash said. My PTS team has just finished their investigation. He motioned to the opening. Please, slide under. Langdon stared at the narrow crawl space at his feet, and then up at the massive iron grate. He's kidding, right? The barricade looked like a guillotine waiting to crush intruders. Fash grumbled something in French and checked his watch. Then he dropped to his knees and slithered his bulky frame underneath the grate. On the other side, he stood up and looked back through the bars at Langdon. Langdon sighed. Placing his palms flat on the polished parquet, he lay on his stomach and pulled himself forward. As he slid underneath, the nape of his Harris tweed snagged on the bottom of the grate, and he cracked the back of his head on the iron. Very suave, Robert, he thought, fumbling, and then finally pulling himself through. As he stood up, Langdon was beginning to suspect it was going to be a very long night. Chapter 5 Murray Hill Place The new Opus Dei World Headquarters and Conference Center is located at 243 Lexington Avenue in New York City. With a price tag of just over $42 million, the 133,000-square-foot tower is clad in red brick and Indiana limestone. Designed by May and Pinska, the building contains over 100 bedrooms, six dining rooms, libraries, living rooms, meeting rooms, and offices. The second, eighth, and sixteenth floors contain chapels ornamented with millwork and marble. The seventeenth floor is entirely residential. Men enter the building through the main doors on Lexington Avenue. Women enter through a different street and are acoustically and visually separated from the men at all times within the building. Earlier this evening, within the sanctuary of his penthouse apartment, Bishop Manuel Aringarosa had packed a small travel bag and dressed in a traditional black cassock. Normally, he would have wrapped a purple cincture around his waist, but tonight he would be traveling among the public and he preferred not to draw attention to his high office. Only those with an erudite eye would notice his 14 karat gold bishop's ring with purple amethyst, large diamonds, and hand-tooled mitre crozier applique. Throwing the travel bag over his shoulder, he said a silent prayer and left his apartment, descending to the lobby where his driver was waiting to take him to the airport. Now, sitting aboard a commercial airliner bound for Rome, Aringa Rosa gazed out the window at the dark Atlantic. The sun had already set, but Aringarosa knew his own star was on the rise. Tonight the battle will be won, he thought, amazed that only months ago he had felt powerless against the hands that threatened to destroy his empire. As President General of Opus Dei, Bishop Aringarosa had spent the last decade of his life spreading the message of God's work, literally, Opus Dei. The congregation, founded in 1928 by the Spanish priest Jose Escriva promoted a return to conservative Catholic values and encouraged its members to make sweeping sacrifices in their own lives in order to do the work of God. Opus Dei's traditionalist philosophy initially had taken root in Spain during Franco's regime, but with the 1934 publication of Jose Escriva's spiritual book, The Way, 999 Points of Meditation for Doing God's Work in One's Own Life, Escriva's message exploded across the world. Now, with over four million copies of The Way in print in 42 languages, Opus Dei was a global force. Residence halls, teaching centers, and even universities could be found in almost every major metropolis on Earth. Opus Dei was the fastest growing and most financially secure Catholic organization in the world. Unfortunately, Aringarosa had learned, in an age of religious cynicism, cults, and televangelists, Opus Dei's escalating wealth and power was a magnet for suspicion. Many call Opus Dei a brainwashing cult, reporters often challenged. Others call you an ultra-conservative Christian secret society. Which are you? Opus Dei is neither, the bishop would patiently reply. We are a Catholic church. We are a congregation of Catholics who have chosen as our priority to follow Catholic doctrine as religiously as we can in our own daily lives. Does God's work necessarily include vows of chastity, tithing, and atonement for sins through self-flagellation and the psyllis? You are describing only a small portion of the Opus Dei population, Aringarosa said. 
There are many levels of involvement. Thousands of Opus Dei members are married, have families, and do God's work in their own community. Others choose lives of asceticism within our cloistered residence halls. These choices are personal. But everyone in Opus Dei shares the goal of bettering the world by doing the work of God. Surely this is an admirable quest. Reasons seldom work, though. The media always gravitated towards scandal, and Opus Dei, like most large organizations, had within its membership a few misguided souls who cast a shadow over the entire group. Two months ago, an Opus Dei group at a Midwestern university had been caught drugging new recruits with mescaline in an effort to induce a euphoric state that neophytes would perceive as a religious experience. Another university student had used his barbed ceviche belt more often than the required two hours a day and had given himself a lethal infection. Not long ago, a young investment banker had signed over his entire life savings to Opus Dei before jumping off a building to his death. Misguided sheep, Aringarosa thought, his heart going out to them. Of course, the ultimate embarrassment had been the widely publicized trial of FBI spy Robert Hansen, who, in addition to being a prominent member of Opus Dei, had turned out to be a sexual deviant, his trial uncovering evidence that he had rigged hidden video cameras in his own bedroom so his friends could watch him having sex with his wife. Hardly the pastime of a devout Catholic, the judge had noted. Sadly, all of these events had helped spawn the new watch group known as the Opus Dei Awareness Network, O-D-A-N. The group's popular website, www.odan.org, relayed frightening stories from former Opus Dei members who warned of the dangers of joining. The media was now referring to Opus Dei as God's Mafia and the Cult of Christ. We fear what we do not understand, Aringa Rosa thought, wondering if these critics had any idea how many lives Opus Dei had enriched. The group enjoyed the full endorsement and blessing of the Vatican. Opus Dei is a personal creditor of the Pope himself. Recently, however, Opus Dei had found itself threatened by a force infinitely more powerful than the media, an unexpected foe from which Aringarosa could not possibly hide. Five months ago, the kaleidoscope of power had been shaken, and Aringarosa was still reeling from the blow. They know not the war they have begun, Aringarosa whispered to himself, staring out the plane's window at the darkness of the ocean below. For an instant, his eyes refocused, lingering on the reflection of his awkward face, dark and oblong, dominated by a flat, crooked nose, that had been shattered by a fist in Spain when he was a young missionary. The physical flaw barely registered now. Aringarosa's was a world of the soul, not of the flesh. As the jet passed over the coast of Portugal, the cell phone in Aringarosa's cassock began vibrating in silent ring mode. Only one man possessed the number, the man who had mailed Aringarosa the phone. Excited, the bishop answered, Yes? Silas has located the keystone, the caller said. It is in Paris, within the church of saint sulpice Bishop Aringa Rosa smiled. Then we are close. We can obtain it immediately, but we need your influence. Of course. Tell me what to do. When Aringa Rosa hung up the phone, his heart was pounding. He gazed once again into the void of night. Feeling dwarfed by the events he had put into motion. 500 miles away, the albino called Silas stood over a small basin of water and dabbed the blood from his back, watching the patterns of red spinning in the water. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean, he prayed, quoting songs. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Silas